Hey guys, welcome to Discovery. Thanks for checking us out. My name is Kai Gratton. If you were one of the seven doors from Snow White, which one would you be? Now let us know down in the chat. Thank you for checking us out today. My name is Lauren. What is the last movie you saw? The last movie I saw was the Mamma Mia movies.
decided to join us today. My name is Frances Huffman and I have a question for you. If you could be in any TV show, any movie, ever, what would you pick? And which character would you play? I know that I'd probably have to pick Samwise Gamgee from The Lord of the Rings. Let me know in the comments down below who you would be. Hey, what's up guys? Welcome to Discovery. Thanks for checking us out today. My name is Caden Gratton and uh, I have a question for you. Would you rather lose your ability to speak or the ability to read? Let us know in the chat. Welcome to Discovery Online. We're so glad you're here with us today. Why don't you go ahead and stand up wherever you are and get ready to worship with us. Forever in your name, the name of 
continue to sing a new song that we sang last week. It's called We Praise You. We invite you to continue singing as we sing out this truth. We hope that this is an anthem for you, that he is victorious. Let it ride. 
Thanks for checking out Discovery today. My name is Caitlin. My name is Christian. This is Armaya and Brian. My name is Garrett Smith, and today we have three quick things that we wanted to let you know about. The first announcement is that Rooted starts up. It is a free and online course that goes for 10 weeks and goes through seven important rhythms in, with your church, with God, and with yourself. It is online and you can still sign up today. Second is that we are having a young adult trivia night next this Tuesday at 8.30 over on our Facebook page. Check it out, win some prizes, and if I was old enough, I would win. Last is that Live at 7 is happening next Sunday, May 17th at 7 p.m. over on our YouTube channel. It is for any student that is in grades six to 12. You don't wanna miss it. I love my mom because she is the best mom ever. We love our mom because she's always there for us. She's really funny. And she always helps us. I love my mommy so much because she's always in my heart. Tell me one thing you da, love about da, mommy. Da, 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 da. When she kisses you. I love about mommy that she takes care of me. Mommy's the best mom. We love having movie nights with mom. I love you because you let me trade Pokemon cards on the bus and you let me buy whatever I want. I love you mommy because you let me hold your hand and I love your face because you're so sweet to me. I'm thankful for mom because she takes care of us. I'm thankful for mom because she bought me a really cool Lego set. I love mom because she does fun things with us like go on bike rides. I love mom because she helps us with school. Hi everyone, happy Mother's Day. We love our mom because she takes really good care of us. And she's really funny and kind. We love you mom. I love my mom because she makes us good food. I love my mom because she scratches my back. I love my mom because she loves me. Love my mom because she is sweet and very kind. I love you, mommy. I love my mom because she helps me when I'm feeling down before she does anything for herself. I love my mom because she helps me with everything. She's the best mom ever. Love you, mom. Bye. Love you, mom. You're the best mom ever. Yeah. Hi, mom. Thank you for the being the best mom in the world. You have done so many things for us, and we love you. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. The best thing I love about you is 
that you take care of my needs, so I'm gonna take care of yours by making you coffee today. You're the best moms. We love you. Love you so much. One thing I love about my mom is that she's always very encouraging. One thing I love about my mom is that she is a great teacher. One thing I love about my mom is that she makes great food. One thing I love about my mom is she always helps me with my schoolwork in the morning. I love my mommy because she lets me read books to her. There's a lot of things I love about my mommy, but the thing I like most about her is that she wants us to stay healthy. I love my because I'm high and my kids home. And my, and, and my, I don't like lying with home. I love my mom because she loves me so much and she plays games with me and goes on hikes and I have lots of fun with my mom. I love my mom. One thing I love about mommy is she plays with me. Hi, mommy. I love you because you help me. You talk me in every night at bedtime. I love you. Hi, mommy. Um, I love you because you make me laugh and you help me cook and stuff. I love you. Happy, Happy Mother's, Mother's Day, Day mom. mom. I'm thankful for mom. I'm thankful for you because you help us because you make food for us and you hug us. I'm thankful for you, Mom, because you encouraged me and encouraged my love for reading. She helps me do my schoolwork. That she shares her chocolate. And she hasn't thrown out my favorite shirt even though it's really old and she hates it. I love you because you keep me safe. I love you because you take care of me. I love you because you cuddle with me. Happy Mother's Day! Hey everyone, I am so glad that you, yes you, have joined Discovery Online this weekend. And if you're new around here, we want to get to know you and we've made it super simple. All you need to do is click the connect button there in the chat and then we're going to send you an invite for a coffee hangout called Digital Coffee with Discovery where you can select a time that works for you and your drink, it's on us. Just a way that we want to show our appreciation to you for choosing to worship with us, and we can't wait to meet you. This week, we're continuing our series about Tomorrowland, and we've been looking ahead to what God has prepared for us in heaven as we partner with him in bringing heaven to earth here and now. So I've asked my wife, Janie, to teach this week's message, and she's going to walk us through what it means to be made in the image of God. You ever heard someone say that before? How God delights in working uniquely through each of us to reveal certain aspects of his character to the world. And as we celebrate Mother's Day, let's reflect on the aspects of God's character that are revealed through our moms. You know, I'm so glad to have a mom who has helped me see God as a caring and nurturing God. She has also shown me, growing up, how God holds the tension of freedom while putting safe and healthy boundaries around me and my other siblings growing up. Let me also say that I'm very aware that for many people, Mother's Day comes with a lot of pain. It's another reason I'm really glad that Janie is teaching this weekend because she navigates a lot of those challenges as well. You know, she's experienced the confusion that comes with infertility, but also the joy of adopting our boys. She relishes time with her 87-year-old mom while knowing that dementia is fading her mom's memories away. 
And she takes on mom duties with our boys while looking for ways to be a spiritual mom to to many others who don't have moms in their lives. So as we think about the things that we are learning about heaven in this Tomorrowland series, we can rest assured that there will be no more painful parts of Mother's Day in heaven. No more. Families will be reunited with their children who miscarried or were stillborn. And moms who've passed away will greet you with a welcoming hug. And there will be no more memories of abuse at the hands of a parent. And no more pandemics that keep us away from our moms on special days like today. So my prayer today is that we can thank God for his perfect plan for families and motherhood while acknowledging that this world is not as it should be. So until we are in his presence in heaven, let's look for ways to be family to those who don't have one, to provide care to those who need it, and to seek out every opportunity to bring heaven to earth. Let's go to Tomorrowland. We could momentarily escape from our 21st century lives and fill the room with stereophonic music from another age. So over the past few months, it has taken me quite a while to get my brain wrapped around the whole mask thing. It's not that I'm wearing a mask. I'm more than willing to do whatever is needed to help us collectively keep ourselves healthy in this pandemic. What paralyzed me, though, was the confusion around the whole mask thing. I'm known in my job as being somebody who craves clarity. And as all the information started coming in about masks, it was so hard to know what to do. You must wear a mask, but only the right kind of mask. You don't have to wear a mask. In fact, don't wear one because you're going to keep them away from anyone else who really needs them. I was actually so glad when the Pennsylvania governor started requiring us to wear masks because then it was crystal clear. I need to get myself a mask. But in the busyness of everything, I hadn't really looked into it. I didn't know where to start. And I was chit-chatting one day with my friend Jen Lee And the next thing I know, we get this delivery of the most amazing customized mask for each of our family. So here's Chase in the video game mask that Jen had picked out for him. And here is Jackson with the New York Yankees Mickey Mouse mask. How nice is that? It just made me feel so special that Jen helped me in such a personal and sweet way and helped me with my angst of this very uncomfortable situation for all of us. So thanks to Jen, I took my mask she made for me and I prayed up and I found the courage to finally go to the store. And I have to tell you, it was tense. We're all walking around trying to keep our distance and there's a whole new set of social norms in the grocery store, one-way lines. But with every trip, I get more used to it. And in fact, now I even smile at people as much as I can. And I probably weird them out a little bit because I kind of need to see all the different styles and ways people are showing the personalities through their masks. But what's strange to me is how quickly it became normal to me because it's not the way it's supposed to be. We're not supposed to be walking around wearing masks. And yet I think we would all agree that the recent developments of physical mask wearing is a powerful symbol of the metaphorical mask that we all walk around with all the time. And so that's what we're gonna talk about today, that the citizens of Tomorrowland don't wear masks. And the big idea is that we bring heaven to earth when we see ourselves in God's image. In our reading today, we'll see that citizens of Tomorrowland or citizens of heaven are made in the image of God. And that he delights in bringing heaven to earth by revealing aspects of his character to the world through us but the world's broken and something happened that made us want to hide. So what was it that happened? Let's go back to the beginning and find out. We're going to be reading the Bible today from Genesis 1 through 3. And we'll have the verses up on the screen, um, but you're welcome to follow along in your Bible or Bible app. Let's start with Genesis 1, 26 to 27. Then God said, let us make 
human beings in our image to be like us. They will reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, the livestock, all the wild animals on the earth, and the small animals that scurry along the ground. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female. He created them in the beginning. In the beginning, God created the perfect world. And then he did his best work. He created men and women, his image bearers. And when he did that, in verse 31, he said that was very good. Genesis 2 recaps the creation story. And then it says something very significant. It says, now the man and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. God created Adam and Eve to be the perfect reflection of him. So because of that, Adam and Eve were perfect. They had no shame. Their lack of shame was not due to ignorance. It was due to innocence. They didn't know that evil existed. So they had nothing to hide, nothing to protect, no need for clothes, no need for masks, complete freedom. Now, God loved Adam and Eve so much that he wanted to protect them. But he also wanted them to value the freedom they had. So he gave them a choice. Let's go back to Genesis 2, 9 and see what that choice is. The Lord God made all sorts of trees grow in the garden from the ground, trees that were beautiful and that produced delicious fruit. In the middle of the garden, he placed the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. The Lord placed the man in the garden of Eden to tend and watch over it. But the Lord warned him, you may freely eat the fruit of every tree in the garden, except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you eat that fruit, you will surely die. So God says to Adam and Eve, this is paradise and it's all yours. You are free to access everything in this garden. And because I want to protect that freedom, I need you to stay away from one thing. Trust me, you do not want to go there. But then a terrible thing happens. In Genesis 3, they went there. Verse 1, the serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord had made. One day he asked the, the woman, did you, God really say you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? You won't die, the serpent, the serpent replied to the woman. God knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it, and you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. The woman was convinced. She saw that the tree was beautiful and its fruit looked delicious, and she wanted the wisdom it would give her. So she took some of the fruit and she ate it. Then she gave some, of, some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it too. At that moment, their eyes were opened, and they suddenly felt shame at their nakedness, so they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. God made everything perfect in the Garden of Eden. In fact, every day of creation, he said, this is good. Adam and Eve were perfect in the image of God, joyously free to delight in life with him and with one another. But because they believed the lie that there was something more liberating than what God had to give them, they ate from the wrong tree. And with it, came the knowledge of good and evil. Though they'd never worn clothes before, now all of a sudden they need to cover themselves. They had been living in the freedom of only knowing good. But now their purity is gone. They're now aware that evil exists. And this created in them a fearful urge to cover themselves, to hide from each other, to mistrust each other's motives and thoughts and to protect themselves. All of that distorted their image of God. So now they realize that the devil promised them great freedom. But now what they actually got was an awareness that evil exists, that they have to hide. So they're bound and constricted by the coverings that cover their shame. I think about this with our boys so much. So they're 10 and 11. And up to this point, they were filled with such innocence. Now, because sin is in the world, they have a sinful nature and they make bad choices. But when they were little, they only knew what they knew. And for the most part, that vantage point was pretty naive. So as they got older, we had to talk to them a thing about painful things. And I can vividly remember talking to Jackson about child abuse. And you could just see on his sweet face, the realization come over him of how incredibly he sad he was that a parent could even do such a thing. His eyes were open that evil existed. And now as we talk to our boys about their bodies and sexuality, we talk about pornography. 
because it's available everywhere and we want them to hear about it from us. But even by telling them about these things, it opens their eyes. And so while they're baffled that people could treat God's creation with such lack of respect, it also creates a curiosity in them, the same kind of curiosity that Adam and Eve had. And so we have to have conversations with them about leaning on God and looking, using tools to make sure that they're turning to God with that curiosity and not turning to worthless things. And so here in the story of Adam and Eve, we have the Genesis version of the first face mask, the fig leaf. It's the same with us. The devil lies to us. We believe him. We make bad choices. Our view of God gets distorted. We put on our mask. And so we hide our true selves, our image bearing selves. God's still present in his perfect image, but sin blocks our reflection of him in the same way that clouds block the sun. And just like the personalized mask that Jen made for my boys, the figurative mask that we wear are customized. They're based on the wounds we've encountered and the expectations of others and the lies we've grown to believe. Because the people around us aren't perfect, we get a pretty inaccurate view of God from his image bearers. So from our youth to our adulthood, whether it was through anger or jest, um, we've allowed ourselves to hear a false narrative from the people around us. And the devil uses that to build a case against us and we start believing those lies. So we put on a variety of masks. Some of those masks protect us. Masks like fear or control, withdrawal or addiction, while others disguise us. They make us uh, project who we think other people expect us to be, like perfectionism, productivity, and achievement. My customized mask on the outside that Jen gave me is a super cool unicorn mask, but my figurative customized mask is people-pleasing. The church I grew up in taught me to value the Bible. I grew up knowing scriptures and knowing all the key stories. But what I didn't learn was God's personal grace-filled love for me. So I grew up in a relationship with God that felt like he was always judging my behavior. Today I gave to the poor and I memorized the Bible. Yay, God loves me. Tomorrow I said a cuss word and I missed church. Bam, God's mad at me and I'm going to hell. I started to believe the lies of Satan. You've messed up too much for God to love you. You haven't done enough for God to love you. You need to work harder. Or the lies that I told myself. If that person doesn't like you, then it must you are just not worth anything. You're not good enough for anything good to happen to you. Things are a mess. You're the one to blame. Now you have to fix it. I became a serial people pleaser. And this manifested itself in some ugly ways. I was so hungry for people to like me that I became a direct reflection of whoever I was looking at at the moment. At its worst, this belief manifested itself in a way that was very socially acceptable. I became a workaholic. I was so driven by accolades that came from a job well done that I compromised so much in some of my closest relationships. But as we see in this next part of Genesis, Whatever we hide behind, God comes and he finds us. Let's look at Genesis 3, 6 to 8, or 8 to 11. When the cool evening breezes were blowing, the man and his wife heard the Lord God walking about in the garden. So they hid from the Lord among the trees. Then the Lord God called to the man, where are you? He replied, I heard you walking in the garden. So I hid. I was afraid because I was naked. Who told you you were naked? The Lord God asked. Have you eaten from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat? And the Lord God made clothing from animal skins for Adam and his wife. This verse is such an eye-opening insight into God and his love. Immediately after Adam and Eve make an incredibly bad choice, God comes after him, them. He pursues them. Not only that, God shows them that despite that bad choice, he would still provide for them. Their flimsy fig leaves weren't going to adequately cover their guilt and their shame. God knew that. He knew they needed a better covering. So by giving them the animal skins, he gave them the hope of a greater solution. The rest of the story in the Bible, from creation to revelation, is all about God's plan to come after us too as is foreshadowed by the animal who died to provide the skin for Adam and Eve, God's plan to cover our sin problem is Jesus. 
Eventually, Jesus himself bled and died on the cross to provide a final covering for the sins of all who would trust in him for salvation. When we choose to believe in God's plan and to follow Jesus, God removes our sin. He removes our shame. Our masks are removed. And once again, we can reflect his image to the world. 2 Corinthians 3.16 tells us this. But whenever someone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. For the Lord is the spirit. And wherever the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So all of us who have had that veil removed can see and reflect the glory of, God, of the Lord. And the Lord, who is the spirit, makes us more and more like him as we are changed into his glorious image. So how do we begin the process of returning to the image of God? Well, first, to reflect God's image, we must know who God is. Every one of us is on a journey to shed the masks that bind us and be liberated back to full exposure. We long to know God entirely and to be entirely and fully known by him. But we can't have a true estimate of who we are until we see who God is. I use a lot of personality tests in my job, and I believe in individualization. But we can't start with ourselves. Focusing on ourselves without God is not beneficial. It keeps us focused on the flaws and the brokenness, and that's exactly where God wants us to focus. No, in order to be truly free, we have to start with knowing God. He's the ideal. He's the perfect image. And then as we understand how perfect he is and how broken we are, we rely on him. And then we begin to truly understand who we are. How do we get to know God? First, we need to study our Bibles. We have got to dig into God's word and learn who he is first. As we do, we start knowing and believing the truth about his character. Then God meets us where we are personally. He knows the masks we wear, so we step out from behind them to explore who he is, and he shows himself to us. Every story we read reveals more of who he is to us. I can't emphasize enough how important this is. There's so many Bible resources right now. The Bible app, the Bible app for kids, group Bible studies like Rooted, individual Bible studies, right now media videos. Pray and ask God to show you how he wants to educate you about him and lean in. The other way that we learn about God is through engagement through the local church. This pandemic is forcing all of us to work out our own salvation. That includes connection with a local church. Church has become almost like a choose your own adventure right now in that we get to decide when we attend worship services or when our kids go to class based on live or on demand. We are responsible for gathering the communion elements and having them ready to take. We discern how to love and serve our neighbors. Soon, we're going to have the opportunity to host worship services in our homes. And when that, we get to take the lead in inviting people in and in sharing a worship experience together. All of this gives us a huge opportunity to focus on God and to ask him how we can connect with him uniquely. Another way that we learn about God is by developing personal spiritual rhythms like prayer, prayer walks, praying on our knees, individual worship and singing, giving, sacred rhythms of solitude and silence and stillness. Those are the ones that are really hard for me. Our faith is our responsibility. And the only way we're going to work that out is if we're seeking out God's character in all these ways. These aren't tasks to be accomplished or lists to check off. God doesn't require us to do these things. He doesn't want these things from us. He wants these things for us. And I want them for you because it's been such a game changer in my life. It's been through reading God's word and hearing Matt's teaching that my skewed theology has been redefined. I've gone from seeing God and his love as distant and for everybody else to now seeing that he is with me and he is for me. And that if I was the only person on this earth, he still would have sent Jesus to die for just me. Now, I have to regularly remind myself of this, and we have to remind each other of this, too. I was talking to six different women this week who have each had their lives disrupted by this pandemic, each in very different ways. I have one friend who is juggling with the chaos of a house full of kids, while another is struggling with loneliness because she lives by herself. One of my friends is overwhelmed with an extra load of work, while another one is out of work 
and is downloaded with an extra load of debt. One of my friends is so overcome with fear that she's afraid she will never be able to leave her, her home again for fear that she'll be sick, while another friend cannot wait to get out of the house because she's on day 49 of COVID-19. I hear the weakness in their voice. I give them my weaknesses. We encourage each other. We celebrate with each other what God is doing and the work he's doing. And we remind each other that God is strong and he is so much stronger than this pandemic. When we know who God is, we know ourselves. Because God is so vast, we all reflect a unique aspect of his character. The more we understand of him, the more of that unique character we're able to see in ourselves. If we see ourselves as not good enough, we'll constantly strive to work hard at doing the right thing and at being good. But when we invest the time to know God, we realize that God is good. Therefore, if we reflect his image, we are good. The hard work isn't about being good. The hard work is in choosing every day to pursue God instead of pursuing our own paths. When we spend time with God and he removes our masks, it changes us. I stop looking to people to give me joy and I start cheering them on. My passion changes from pleasing people to developing people. Matt's masks, they compel him to seek out success. When he's closely connected to God, his focus shifts from seeking his own fame to exalting the name of Jesus. Somebody who feels out of control might want to wield power over the weak, but the more they know Jesus, they relinquish that, relinquish that control and they become an advocate for the helpless. Somebody who feels unsafe tends to hoard and distance, but the more they know God, they see themselves as secure and safe. They take off their mask and they become loyal and they become courageous. When we know who God is, we reflect his character. And this is where we bring heaven to earth. If God's plan for, was for us to just be saved, then the minute that we decided to follow Jesus, he would take us into heaven. But 2 Peter 3, 9 tells us that God is incredibly patient with us to give us all the space to fully repent and to grow into who he intended us to be. So my purpose now is to reflect the image of God into people's lives so they'll see themselves that way too. When God's image is evident in us, people are drawn to it. Right now, when we're out and about, we're not wearing a mask, people notice. Likewise, when we're out and we take off our implied masks, and we're vulnerable, we don't try to cover up, we be who we really are, people pay attention. They want that liberation and they lean in and want more. God picked you to be in your job, in your home. He picked you for discovery, to be in your neighborhood, to bring heaven into those places. God picked you to be you, to be where you're at. So let him show us to, how to take off our masks and to show us who we really are so that we can live out our purposes he so clearly has prepared for us. Well, today we are going to take communion together, something we get to do every week as a family. And then this is a time where we are able to just sit and reflect upon the sacrifice of Jesus. And we invite you right now to grab those elements, a little bit of bread and a little bit of juice to represent the blood and the body of Christ that was poured out for each and every one of us on the cross. And we invite you to grab those elements and go ahead and take communion right now during this next song as we sing this over you. And this is just a song that is just speaking to just, just ministering to us, just reminding ourselves that God is a God that clears all confusion, that in the midst of a storm, in the midst of a rage, he is able to just walk in and peace is able to be had. So I hope that that comforts you today. And again, we invite you whenever you're ready to go ahead and to take
there is hope in every single word you say. And I don't want to miss one word you speak. Because everything you say is life to me. passage um, that really goes along with the next song that we're going to sing. It's Psalm 138, verses 7 and 8. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve my life. You stretch out your hand against the anger of my foes. With your right hand, you save me. The Lord will vindicate me. Your love, Lord, endures forever. Do not abandon the works of your hands.
Thank you.